We read together to remind us of where we are going, that is towards Jesus, allowing the scriptures, the Holy Spirit, and the family of God to form a fidelity of allegiance to him alone. Please read aloud with me as we confess this together. We believe the gospel is the good news that God our Father, the Creator, out of his great love for us, has come to rescue us from sin, Satan, death, and hell, and to renew all things in and through the work of Jesus Christ on our behalf, to establish his kingdom through his people who participate in loyal allegiance in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is for God's great glory and our profound joy. Well, good morning. Welcome to Faith Church. My name is Matthew. If we haven't had a chance to meet personally yet, one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to stand and open the scriptures with you. Um, I, uh, today, I've just been kind of stirred and overwhelmed with a sense this morning of just gratitude. Uh, just so thankful to be a part of this local family. I just, I just love this house. I love the people. I love you all. I love what God is doing. I love that our church is uh, for families, right? That we love family. This is a family place where we want you to belong to the family of God overall, but also belong here locally too. And uh, I love that we're a family church. I love that we love the next generation. In fact, we have so many people in this room who are wearing uh, red and green and blue Faith Kids bright t-shirts. And I love those of you who are serving in Faith Kids in the next generation. Can we just say thank you to all of those who serve uh, back in kids ministry? We are so thankful for you. I love that we have environments and spaces for kids to come that are safe, that are fun, and where they get to learn about Jesus at whatever level of life they are on, and they get to worship in their own ways. We are not providing free babysitting service on Sunday morning. We are raising new disciples to follow Jesus, and we want to resource you as parents to help you to raise your kids in your home in the ways of God as well. And it's a great partnership, and we, we're honored to do it. Um, man, let's go to Matthew chapter 9 today. We're continuing this collection of sermons uh, entitled The King Jesus Gospel. And we've been walking through the book of Matthew together. And uh, last week in Matthew 8, we, we saw how Jesus was illustrating his authority or power that God had given to him over sickness and evil spirits and powers and nature even itself. And kind of been journeying through looking at who Jesus is, the, the kingdom that he came announcing, the gospel that he proclaimed and the implications that it has for our lives um, if you want to follow along, you can scan the QR code on the screen and spot for you to take notes there uh, or read the scriptures along with us. Matthew chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 1 today, says this, Jesus climbed into a boat and went back across the lake to his own hometown. Some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat, seeing their faith. Jesus said to the paralyzed man, be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. I, I wish I had time to talk to you about this man and his, his friends. I, I would talk to you about the importance of having people in your corner who, when you are broken, know how to bring you to Jesus. Oh, that was worth saying amen and you missed it, but that's all right. I'm not preaching on that today. Just something for you to think about. I wish I had time to talk to you about the healing that Jesus brings. In fact, I'm going to take some time next week and talk about healing overall. I wish I had time to talk to you about how Jesus says he saw their faith. Most of us feel like faith is invisible. Like faith is something that we intellectually or doctrinally or somehow accept a truth and then just believe it in our minds. But it's hard to see somebody else's thoughts, isn't it? But Jesus saw their faith. What, what is that all about? I wish I had time to talk to you about it. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today. Worth noting, though, maybe you can ponder on it later. Jesus said, be encouraged, my child. Your, your sins are forgiven. And oh, but some of the teachers of the religious law said to themselves, that's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? You don't read the Bible with different verses, voices in your head? I, only me? I'm the only one who hears those voices? Fair, fair enough. 
But Jesus knew what they were thinking, and so he asked them, why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Is it easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, take the mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority, somebody say authority, has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, Stand up, pick up your bed, and go. The man jumped up. He went home, and fear swept through the crowd as they saw this happen. They praised God for giving humans such, what's that word? Authority. Verse 9, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew. Some versions say Levi. It's the same person. Some said, named Matthew, sitting in his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But then the Pharisees saw this. They asked his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with such scum? When Jesus heard this, he said, Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy and not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous. Not those who think they are righteous because their grandma went to church. Not those who think they are righteous because they grew up in America. Not those who think they are righteous because they're at church every week and they're all dressed up and dolled up and look, look the part real good. Not those who think they are righteous because they've got a Bible with their, letter, their name engraved on the front of that genuine leather-bound article. Not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. One day the disciples of John the Baptist came to Jesus and asked him, why do your disciples not fast like we do and like the Pharisees do? Jesus replied, do wedding guests mourn while celebrating with the groom? (laughs) Of course not. But someday the groom will be taken away from them and then they will also fast. Besides, who would patch old clothing with new cloth? The new patch would shrink and rip away from the old cloth, leaving an even bigger tear than before. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, for the old wineskins would burst from the pressure, spilling the wine and ruining the skins. No, new wine is stored in new wineskins, so they are both preserved. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Can we pray? Jesus, you are truth. You are the way, and you bring real life. As we examine these scriptures, I pray, Lord, that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts ready to receive. Lord, help us accept it and walk in it. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. I don't know how many of you would fall into the category of heathen like me, Uh, And you have seen the movie uh, Talladega Nights, Ballad of Ricky Bobby. Uh, See, a few of you are sinners like me. It's fine. It's good. Uh, It's okay to be honest. We'll have a time of repenting all together later on at the end of church. Um, There's a scene in the movie that's kind of iconic and made its way through uh, culture here. And they're sitting around the dinner table praying, getting ready to say grace, as all good Christians do. And getting ready to say grace for this feast of Taco Bell and Mountain Dew and Kentucky Fried Chicken and whatever else they had on the table. And they all start going around saying, well, I like to say grace to to little Jesus. I like to think of Jesus as a little boy or like the man-child Jesus, the one on the cross. They start talking about how they want to pray to the baby Jesus who wears a gold diaper and 12-pound, 7-ounce baby Jesus sleeping in a manger. That's the Jesus I like to pray to. And, And they're just 
in their own minds, crafting and imagining and creating what they think Jesus was and did and said. And the reality is this. I think many of us have a temptation to try to craft Jesus into our own image too. But the reality is that Jesus calls us to be shaped into his image, not us to craft Jesus into our own image. And if we're not careful, we'll allow the reality of our world and the times in which we live in uh, where we try to make Jesus be the kind of Jesus that we want him to be. We, we want the soft Jesus and the always loving Jesus and riding a unicorn and rainbow Jesus. And we want, some of us want Jesus who's like angry all the time and lightning bolts coming from his fingers and attacking the evil people and uh, riding a horse with his sword dipped in blood and warrior Jesus. And we, we want Jesus to be all the things we want him to be. But friends, we're not called to make Jesus in our own image. We're called to see Jesus for who he is and allow as we follow the way of Jesus, him to be shaped into, shape us to be more like him. This is what it looks like when Jesus is king and we participate in his kingdom. This is what we're after is looking at the scriptures. Who is King Jesus and what is he communicating to us? And so far in the gospel of Matthew, he's given us many different views and understanding different aspects of who Jesus is and what he, he was called to do, what he was about, what his purpose was. We've already seen in the beginning of Matthew that Jesus was a miracle infant born of a virgin, of a child foretold of long ago. We see Jesus coming from the royal line of David, so he is already heir to the throne of royalty. We've seen the backdrop of who he was being presented in a time when Jesus himself came man and was baptized. How not only was he baptized, but he was tempted as human Jesus. We, we've seen Jesus, the evangelist, coming and proclaiming and announcing the good news of the gospel of the kingdom. He was the euangelion, the, the, the gospel presenter and proclaimer of the kingdom of God. We've seen the Jesus who is the teacher sitting on the mountainside, giving us his sermon on the mount, his creed of what does it look like to be a part of the kingdom, walk in the kingdom. We, we've seen teacher Jesus expound and explain to us why the laws and the prophets were so important and still important today. We've seen him presenting some of these things to us. We saw last week how Jesus was a healer, how he had authority, how his word had some power to it. We've seen these different aspects of Jesus. And here in Matthew chapter 9, these first 17 verses, we, we see Matthew give us a snapshot of three little short stories, if you will, of Jesus that present to us something important about him. And the clue of what he's trying to announce to us and show us about Jesus is found in that first section that we read. There was one word that was repeated multiple times in that first few verses that we read, which is the point. And in, 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 our, in our class, How Not to Read the Bible, that we're doing on Wednesday nights, I was teaching the class this last week, and I told them, I said, any time in Scripture... In a short period of time, you see an author use the same word repeated. They're trying to emphasize something. There was a word that was emphasized in that first section. It was the word authority. Now, when I say the word authority, some of you like start to like get triggered a little bit. Because maybe you've experienced an authoritarian kind of parent in your life that was just shy of a dictator. Maybe you shriek a little bit when you hear the word authority in a church context because you've been in very unhealthy contexts of what it looks like to be a part of a church where it was just shy of a cult under a different name. Many of us shriek at the thought of authority because we live in America and our own arrogance tells us we ought to be autonomous to everyone and nobody should be able to tell us what to do. We have this sense within us where our natural response to authority is to kick against it. 
But Jesus is here and presented, and Matthew is trying to help us understand that Jesus has a unique authority. His authority isn't like human authority. He is illustrating that Jesus is divine. That Jesus has some sovereignty. Jesus has some supremacy. Jesus has, is someone who has the authority and the power and, and the right to forgive sins. This is what is happening. They're bringing the friends to, they're bringing this friend to Jesus, and Jesus is, is intentional about letting them know listen, I have sovereign authority. I am the Son of Man, but I have divine authority. Why? Because he wasn't just the Son of Man, he is also the Son of God. He is both God and man. He is the incarnate God, God made flesh and dwelling among us. We believe and we hold to a core truth and essential understanding as followers of Jesus that Jesus is fully God and fully man. We hold to this. We hold firm to this. Look at Colossians chapter 1. It, it talks about the supremacy of Jesus. For Colossians chapter 1, starting in verse 12, it, uh, starting in verse 13, it says this. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness, and he's transferred us into a kingdom of his dear son, who purchased our freedom, and what's that word? Forgave our sins. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. No one has seen God. Jesus put on flesh and came and dwelt among us so that we would see God. He became the visible form of what this divine person and presence is. He existed before anything was ever created, and he is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything. And in the heavenly realms and on earth, he made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he, Jesus, holds all creation creation together Christ is also the head of the church who which is his body he is the beginning supreme somebody say supreme supreme over all who rise from the dead he so he is first in everything for God in all his fullness was pleased to live in Christ and through God reconciled everything to himself he made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's Blood on the cross. And this includes you who were once far away from God. You were his enemies, separated from him by your evil thoughts and actions. Yet now he has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he has brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand with him. Him, stand before him without a single fault. What? How is it we can stand before God without, with a, without a single fault, a single error? You want to know why? Because Jesus illustrates that he is divine. And the divine had the power to forgive sins. When, when they said, and he looks at the lame man, he says, hey, your sins are forgiven. And the Pharisees and the people who were Bible scholars and the teachers, they're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You can't say that. Only God can forgive sins. Bingo, tell them what they won, Ringo, right? Like, this is it. They finally got it. Jesus was intentionally illustrating I am the son of man. Mary was my mom, Joseph my earthly stepfather. But I am also the son of God, divine, sent from heaven, and I have the power and the authority to forgive sins. 
He was announcing something of himself, something amazing. It's interesting, though, because there's a little bit of a tension. Forgiving sins was the domain of the divine. This is what God did. This is what they would bring the sacrifice and the blood of the animals would purify the sins because life is found in the blood and and they would bring all these sacrifices and God gave them this sacrificial system as a way of commemorating and remembering that God wants to dwell among them and he dwells among them only through forgiveness and a pure, holy, sanctified sanctuary of the people of God. God's longing was to be among the people but their rebellion Rebellion and rejection of him in their sin and mutiny against the ways of God led them in a place where they couldn't come close to God, but God wanted them to come close to him, so he sent his son to get even closer. And this gift of forgiveness God was bringing to us. Friends, it's not that Jesus was just illustrating that he is divine. I think we need to understand that the reason Jesus illustrated that he is divine is because he wants a direct relationship with you and me. Why does it matter that Jesus is divine? Here's why. Because the divine son of God became the son of man so that the sons of man could become sons and daughters of God, belonging to the family of God. It's so that we could become his kids so that we could become friends of God. Friends, hear me. Jesus does not want your religion. He wants a relationship with you. He's after your heart and he wants to walk with you in relationship. And these three stories that Matthew has chosen to illustrate, these three encounters of a lame man, of a tax collector himself, and his fr- partying friends, as wild as they were, and, and incredulous, and just scum accordingly, uh, were there. And then he talks about patches of garments and wine. Why, why, what was he trying to articulate? That Jesus is divine, has the power to forgive sins because he wants a relationship with you and me. How how is this being illustrated? How do we have a relationship with God? You might be sitting there thinking, okay, pastor, I've never heard this before. In fact, I, I didn't even know that we could talk to God. I thought I had to go to a priest and the priest could talk to God and I'm not holy enough to talk to God and why would God listen to my prayers and why would God want to know me and why why this and why, how, how is this even possible? What What is happening here? Let me give you a few things to help you as you begin and grow in your own relationship with Jesus. Here's the first thing you need to understand today, is that Jesus comes near. He's not a distance. He's not aloof. There there isn't anything in your life that could keep Jesus from coming to you. Jesus comes to you. In fact, he says it this way. He says, who is it that needs a doctor anyhow? The sick or the healthy? Who who, who needs the doctor anyways? Friends, Jesus is not scared of the pandemic that is your sinfulness. It's not going to, he's not going to catch it. He's not worried about it. He's coming to cure it. He's coming to remove it. He's coming to forgive it. He's coming to reconcile you. He's coming to help you in your way. But that's going to require that you don't act like you're healthy when you're really sick. It's because you need to recognize, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. If I'm not having a relationship with God, it's because I have yet to acknowledge that he's the physician and I'm the sick patient. Sin is the sickness that separates us and breaks the relationship apart. Go all the way back to the very beginning. God created everything. It was beautiful. It was wonderful. He created this place called paradise so that he could dwell among his people. And they could be fruitful and multiply and enjoy the bounty and the blessing and the beauty of what it was. But they decided to be their own God, their own autonomous, their own arrogance. It says, we're going to be like gods ourselves. And they rebelled in mutiny and did their own thing. And the minute that happened, sin entered the world. And all the good things that God had created began to fracture and break apart. And we see in the very first story, here's a lame man, broken. Incapable of getting to Jesus on his own. 
And the first thing Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Friends, you are broken and you can't get to Jesus on your own. That's why Jesus comes near to you and why he comes near to me. I, I find it interesting that Jesus does this and then he comes near and he's hanging out with these sinners, these tax collectors. Matthew and all of his, his, his tax collecting evil uh, people, they're sitting there uh, and probably having a good time, probably having a little too much to drink and the, the, the people around him are like, Jesus, how come you're partying and you're hanging out with such sinners and scum? Why are you a friend of sinners? You know what I love? is that Jesus is indeed friends with sinners. But you know what else is true about Jesus? Jesus didn't become a sinner to hang out with sinners. You know what happens? So many of us in the church, we want to make Jesus into our own image, and we'll hijack this verse and say, yeah, Jesus hung out with sinners, and all we're doing is using incorrect biblical interpretation to justify our unwillingness to stop sinning ourselves. We don't really have any interest in following Jesus. We just don't want to go to hell. We want to believe just enough not to go to hell, but we don't actually want to experience heaven. We, we, so we just say things like, well, see, Jesus hung out with sinners. I can hang out with sinful people. Here's the problem. Jesus was invited to be with them, and it didn't change him. Jesus was with them, but he never became like them. Jesus was not uptight but he did remain living upright in righteousness. Jesus was around them, but he did not ever live like them. But he was around them enough that people looked at him and were like, oh my gosh, he must be a sinner. How come he's hanging out with them? Who needs the light? People in the dark. Who needs healing? People who are sick. And Jesus comes near to them, and he'll come near to you too. In your own sickness, in your own illness, in your own unwillingness to repent of your sin, Jesus is still willing to come to you and say, hey, we can have a relationship. I want to come near to you. The question is, are you willing to awaken to your need for a God, for a doctor, for a sovereign son of man to come near? Have you recognized that what your deepest need is actually forgiveness and wholeness and being made right. Jesus comes near to us. You know what I love is not only does he come near to us, but Jesus gives us his robe of righteousness. Jesus talks about this this cloth, this garment. Jesus says, you know what, I'm here, I'm hanging out. I, I, you can't keep me from you. You're not going to infect. I, I'm here to bring light, and I'm going to bring to heal healing and wholeness, and I'm going to help you. I'm going to show you the way to Jesus or to, to the Father. But, but not only do I want to come near you, if you're going to have a relationship with God, it's going to require that you have a righteousness that isn't your own. And we need Jesus' righteousness. And this is what Jesus is hinting at when he says, uh, you need a garment and you need to put a patch, but don't put a patch on the garment. Get a new garment. Don't try to... To, to do in your own strength to repair the brokenness in yourself because you can't repair it. You can't be good. Well, I'm, I'm going to be good this time. I'm going to do it in my own. I'm going to change this time. It's going to be different this time. I'm not going to do it. No, 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 no. You don't need a patchwork salvation. You need a new garment of his righteousness instead. It's not halfway. It's all the way. This garment was a splendid array of Christ's righteousness. You know what I love is that Jesus was not just creating some new abstract metaphor, this new picture, this garment and patchwork. He was borrowing from the prophet Isaiah because Jesus knew the Old Testament scriptures. He knew the Hebrew scriptures. And in Isaiah 61, verse 10 and 11, it says this, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord for my God. For he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation. He has draped me in a robe of righteousness. I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding. There it is again. The groom. We're having a celebration. Something has arrived. Something new has come. Something great is happening. He's borrowing from Isaiah here. I, I'm like the bridegroom dressed on his wedding with the bride for her jewels. The sovereign Lord will show his justice to the nations of the world. Everyone will praise him. His righteousness will be like a garden in early spring with plants springing up everywhere. 
Jesus wants to come near and have a relationship with you, but he is divine. And if you're going to have a relationship with God Almighty, you need to have righteousness. Righteousness means a way of thinking about righteousness. Let me say it that way. A way of thinking about righteousness is this, right standing with God. And he says, I want to give you a robe, this, this royal treatment, this, this garment that you can put on that's not your own righteousness. Other places in scripture, it says that your righteousness is like filthy rags. Patchwork salvation on your own. It's not how, what Jesus provides. He wants to give you a robe of his righteousness that is beautiful and glorious and allows you to stand before God with a, with a sense of like, wait a second. I actually belong here. I'm, I'm welcomed here. Th- this, this is the place where I can be. That's what his righteousness does. It gives you a sense of right standing in the very presence of God. And that's how we have a relationship with him. But he doesn't just give us a robe so we stand correctly. So Jesus comes near to us. He helps us stand in right position and right relationship with God. And then he takes it a step further and he makes us new and he pours out his spirit into our lives. So Jesus says, you, you don't need to patchwork salvation. I've come, I've come to you because you're sick and you need a doctor. I've come near you. You don't need patchwork salvation. I'm going to give you a whole new garment so you don't look like you got holes in everything and shoddy work. No, no I'm going to give you the real thing, the real deal salvation, that, that robe of right. It's going to be yours. And then I want to give you new wine. And you're not going to put new wine in old wineskin because it's not going to be preserved. It's not going to last. It's not going to work. It's going to be here in the tinkling of a moment and then gone later if you don't actually have a new container for the new wine. It's going to be here and then it's going to be gone. Wine in the Bible is symbolic. It symbolizes a a flourishing, joyful, abundant life, a blessed life. It, It symbolizes the person of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's what new wine symbolizes in Scripture. Look at Ezekiel 36. This is what Jesus wants to do in bringing us, as his divine self, making a relationship with us. Ezekiel 36 says this, And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a a, a new spirit in you. I will take out your stony, stubborn, arrogant, Hard heart, and I will give you a tender, responsive heart. And because it's a new heart, because it's a new container, because it's new on the inside, now that it's a new vat, now that there's a new wineskin of who you are, now that there's something new on the inside, what's he going to do? He says, I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey. In other words, I'm going to give you the spirit of God inside of you so that you can live the way of Jesus as you go, and it will preserve you. It won't be wasted. It won't be half-hearted. It won't be just this moment of power, but then nothing that transforms you beyond it. It's the Spirit of God himself who wants to come and dwell on the inside of you. One commentary I read this week says, makes these comments about this passage in Matthew, where he's talking about the patch and the wine. and it says this, says, the formal regulations of the old religion must give way to the joy of the new. The patch and the new wine are images of powerful, effervescent new relationships with God, which burst out of the dried up confines of formal religion. <laughs> it's this mercy of God that shows up. It's this, this, this presence of God that he wants to pour into your life. He, Ephesians says that it's by grace that we've been saved through faith, not of works. Otherwise, you could boast about it. You can't save yourself. You're the sick one. You need the doctor. You're not the doctor. There's a different doctor. You, you can't patchwork your own way 
to the right standing with God, trying to work your way and make it appear great and beautiful. You can't pretend and pose your way into heaven and into a relationship with Jesus. Because Jesus doesn't want a, a relationship with the you that you pretend to be. Jesus wants a relationship with the real you that he knows you to be. <laughs> so it's not a patchwork thing. And he wants to give you his new wine, the spirit of God. For by grace you've been saved. We, we said it a few weeks ago. Grace is the personification of the person of the Holy Spirit living and dwelling among us. Grace has been defined as the unmerited favor of God, something you don't deserve, and it marks you with the favor of God. What is it that is the most favorable thing that God would ever do for people? What is the greatest thing God wants to give his people? He doesn't want to give them new cars. He doesn't want to give them security and something. No, he wants to give them the fullness of himself. He wants to give you the spirit. He wants to take your old, stony, rebellious, unrepentant, unwilling to acknowledge that you screwed things up. He wants to take that heart that keeps repeating patterns of sin, that heart that wants to craft Jesus into your own image so that you feel better about yourself one day on a Sunday and then to live like hell the rest of the week. He wants to take you, that person, and give you his spirit, his presence. God wants to dwell with you every day, every moment of the day. And in him you can live and move and find your very being because it's the spirit of God that he graces and places in your life Jesus is divine and he's illustrating not only that he is divine and has that sovereign authority that power that access but he wants to use that divinity to create a relationship with you and to create a relationship with me he wants to come near you he wants to give you a garment of righteousness that allows you to stand before God knowing that he's not going to reject you on that day you stand before him. Not because you did good things, but because you have a relationship with Jesus and he's clothed you in the right things. Because you put off the old way of living and you put on a new way of living. And standing in that place with that garment, knowing then that he can give you a new heart pastor i'm having a hard time i can't even believe god i don't know about this I've, I've had a hard life a hard past a lot of hard things going on i just i just don't know that if i made it i'm cut out for this i don't i don't know that i get it all i don't know that I believe it all my I, I kind of in there i'm kind of not there i've got a lot of hard questions i'm really skeptical about some things i'm really this and that listen god wants to give you a new heart your heart won't change with more information your heart will change with surrender and he wants to take the old stony heart that says you heart that's been made alive, a heart that beats with the heart of heaven, a heart that beats for Christ, a heart that beats in a way that is alive in you, and you can receive the fullness of Christ in you. He wants to come near you, and he gives you this gift, this gift of his spirit. He pours it out into a new heart, so it's not wasted. Why does he want to give you a new heart? Because every gift God gives Every gift, thing, it, the biblical understanding is when a gift was given, it was given to elicit a reciprocal relationship. Not another gift, but a response to a gift. A relationship born from an initial gift. Jesus came and was the gift and sacrifice. And when we receive that gift of salvation... The proper response that comes is a relationship with God on the other end. God wants a relationship with you. In fact, Jesus said it like this. He wants to make you a friend of God. Jesus' words in John 15 say this. I've told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Somebody say joy. What is joy? Joy, joy is the mark of the spirit of God living you. New wine. Joy. Laughter. Laughter. If you're following Jesus and you don't have joy, you're doing it wrong. You're doing it wrong. The mark of a follower of Jesus ought to be an abundance and an overflow of joy. It means you're feeding yourself with something. You're trying to patchwork your own salvation and your own Christianity in your own way. No, no. When you receive of the Spirit, there's joy. 
He says, I've told you these things that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Please love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends as you obey these commands. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. No, you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father told me, I've told it to you. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever it is that you ask for in my name. What is Jesus trying to say? Jesus is trying to say, listen, I want to give you this friendship. I'm making you friends with God, not enemies. I want to make you a friend with God, not a foe. I want to make you a friend, not a slave. I don't want you to feel this, this enslaved indebtedness to something. That's not what you're here to do. Trying to earn and pay back a debt that you can't pay. Paul would write and says, God has, God, he would use the same language. He says, Jesus, because of his righteousness and what he did at the cross, he has made you no longer slaves to sin. You're no longer a slave to sin. He's made you a son and a daughter. He's come to make you in his family. And Jesus says, you can do this. Friends, you can know that I am your friend because I love you. And I lay down my life for you. I lay down my life for you. And he did. Died on a cross. Buried. And was resurrected. Now in, ascended and seated and throned in the highest place where he's interceding and praying for you and me. What? What is, he says, the greatest, greatest thing a friend can do, I call you friends. So I'm laying down my life for you. That's his gift. You know what our gift back to him is? That we would love him enough to lay down our life to. They would say, not my will, but your will. Not my life, but your life. Not my righteousness, God, but your righteousness. And we would develop this friendship with God. This friendship with God. I find it so interesting that in the section where Matthew decides to write in his gospel about the divinity of Jesus, where he has the power to forgive sins, that that is the place that Matthew inserts his own testimony of how he was lost, but then was found. How he was dead in his sin, but he heard the call of Jesus to come. And his response wasn't to question it, to doubt it, to wonder if I'm worthy or not. No, no, he fully knew he was a sinner and scum and unworthy. But he decided to get up and follow. I love that phrase, get up. Because Matthew is hinting at what it means to follow Jesus. What it means to have the promise of resurrection life. He was hinting at what, it, what comes after you die to yourself. You know what comes after you die to yourself? You experience the resurrection of a new life inside. The old is gone, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says. The old is gone and new life begins. Because resurrection is what Jesus is all about. That when you die to your sins and die and admit, I'm a sinner, I'm not worthy of this, but he's calling me. I'm stuck, I'm sin, I'm, 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 I'm infected, but he's calling me. And I'm willing to get up and surrender and follow him that somewhere along the way, this miraculous moment of salvation and new life comes into our lives. And now we're friends with God because he came near because he gives us his righteousness and he's given us his spirit in us as a sign and a seal of what is yet to come in the future of the permanent presence of God abiding on earth just like it is in heaven. Friends, Jesus is the divine son of God and son of man and he invites you into a relationship with him and he's calling you into that today. Can we stand as we come to the table of the Lord? And as we're standing here at the table, if you would go ahead and 
kind of grab the elements that you received maybe on your way in and you can open those up. If you're online, you can grab something in your own home as well. Get the bread out and if you're here in the room, you can kind of, once you get the bread out, you can flip it over and open up the juice and just hold on to both the elements together. We come to this table, this, this communion, this place of remembering this covenant, this treaty, this, this relational c- contract that Jesus makes with us, this relational treaty that is bonded in his blood with us. What is it? It's what Colossians says, that while we were enemies of God, he came near to us to make us friends of God. That while we were separated because of our sin, he paid the price so that our sin would no longer have to separate us. It's not so much that sins are just actions that we commit, but sins are the things that keep and and break the relationship with God. And he's given us this example of bread and juice or wine. The bread, it represents the body that was broken. What did we see in the beginning of this passage? There was a man broken in his body, unable to come to Jesus on his own. And Jesus made his body whole. What do we see? Jesus talks about being poured out. It's the new wine. It's the sign of the covenant, the sign of the life of God being poured out in us so that we can now have his life living in us instead of sin and death that we've been enslaved to. This is what this represents. And so we come and we remember that we were once broken and that we were incapable of finding forgiveness on our own. But he provided both for us. For some of you, this will be your first moment of actually repenting and believing in Jesus. That you would begin to enter into a relationship with him today. Through this moment, through this act, by simply just saying, Jesus, I believe that you are those things. That you are God's son sent for me. And I want to receive your salvation, your forgiveness. Would you bow your heads, close your eyes for just a second? And I, I want us to contemplate one, one question. It's the question Jesus asked. Which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or get up, you're healed, walk away. Which is easier? first glance, I think we would all say, well, it's way easier just to say something is forgiven. Because I don't know, I've never laid my hands on somebody who was legs broken and they started walking again. I've never seen that. That seems impossible to me. But might I pose it to you the way that I felt the Spirit pose it to me in my life today, this week? How quick are you when you hear that somebody is sick to say, oh, I'll pray for you. How quick we are to believe that God can heal and we're willing to pray for people to get better and how slow are we to say, I forgive you. I forgive you for taking advantage of me. I forgive them for lying about me. I forgive them for mistreating me. Forgive them for breaking their promise to me. Forgive my boss for failing. I forgive my ex. We fill in the blank. How hard is it for us to say, I forgive you? Which is harder? Which is harder? Today, we get to receive of God's forgiveness for all that we've done, knowing that it's his forgiveness that allows us to give forgiveness to because he paid the price for that sin too. So Lord, as we stand here with the bread, which represents your body, and the juice, which represents your blood, Lord, we acknowledge that it's often hard to forgive others. God, we acknowledge it's hard for us to admit when we've screwed things up. God, we acknowledge that it's hard for us to repent. God, it's hard for us to forgive others who have so wrongfully done things to us. God, it's hard for us to forgive ourselves for the repeated pattern of sin that we've done again and again and again. But you are the Son of God who died, 
who is reigned supreme and you hold all together. And so, God, it's not hard for you because you've already paid the price. And so today as we stand here taking the bread, we remember that your body was broken so that we could find wholeness in ours. We thank you, Lord, for the bread. Let's take it together. And Lord, we thank you for your blood that was poured out. God, we don't always understand the significance of this symbol specifically. But Lord, you, you said that it was enough. You said that his sacrifice, his blood, his poured out, it, it washes us clean. It, it cleans us. It puts the new rag uh, robe on us and it fills us with who you are. So Lord, today as we stand here with a cup, we ask that you would and we remember that you did forgive us and cleanse us today. We thank you for that. Let's take the cup together. In this moment, would you just take a minute and offer your own prayer to the Lord? Just, just your own words of maybe confession, your words of adoration, your own words of surrender to him today. Jesus, your name is life. Life abundant, life full of joy, life overflowing. Jesus, thank you that you are the son of God who became the son of man so that the sons of men could become sons of God. Your name is power. Your name is life. Your name is breaking strongholds in our lives, sin patterns in our life. And we say, Jesus, we cling to you today, our righteous redeemer. Father, I pray today for this family, your people, my friends. I pray, Lord, that you would bless them with the joy of who you are and you would keep them. You would make your face shine on them and be gracious to them. Would you lift your countenance towards them and give them your peace? We pray this in the name of the Father who loves us, the Son who died for us, and the Holy Spirit who is alive, living within those who believe and all the people of God said. Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If, if you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see you in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.